All right, we are live. Um, hi, thank you for joining us. You're with, um, doc, we're with Dr. Tom Tolley for Ask the Vet Friday. I'm going to say Ask, Ask the Vet Friday because we've been doing this every Friday. So. Well, yeah, there you go. Excellent. Happy Friday. Uh -huh. uh, welcome, everybody. And uh, we'll just give, we, I, we have some questions already uh, that we will get through and we're going to get more, I'm sure. So I'm sure you're going to be um, getting some good questions. I love these, I love these, uh, these Q&As with you because we always get, um, Something I never, you probably never thought about before as a question. I certainly haven't heard as a question. Like these are really ones that um, kind of expand your knowledge of, of birds for, you know, the audience is really cool. So. Yes, yes, I, I, I agree. I mean, we learn something all the time. And I think the Friday afternoon uh, time period is, uh, is, is a happy time for yes. everybody. And so, you know, looking forward to the weekend and stuff like that. So. Uh, yes. I think that that's good for the atmosphere. Yeah. So I, I'm going to get like one, uh, just a, one little minute here for, for everyone to log on. And I'm going to throw this question at you while we wait. Um, <laughs> so, so now I've seen two bird flyers in my area for lost birds, which is, you know, the, uh, you're, you just like crossing your fingers that the birds, you know, are found and returned home and happy ending there. Um, if your bird gets out and it's out in the wild, let's say for any certain amount of time and you're, you know, the, you're lucky to get it, you get it back home. Someone finds it, calls you, or, you know, you find it at the local bird store, like you get it back home. Do you need to bring your bird into the vet to get, it? should you have it checked over if it's been outside, like let's say for any length of time missing? Um, <clears throat> I, I, I definitely uh, would do that. Uh, I mean, I would recommend it. I mean, you could do what, you know, anybody can do what they want to do, but it's just like if uh, you look at uh, any of the humans that get lost and they, uh, where are they? They're in the wilderness, um, you know, and then, you know, fortunately they're found like this case, fortunately the birds found, um, they don't go immediately home. <laughs> they usually sure. take them to the physician and they get them checked out to, for dehydration, they don't know what nutrition, they just, you know, just make sure that uh, uh, they're stable and that they no injuries have occurred um, that uh, may not be noticeable. Um, but uh, just a physical exam after this type of period, no different than they would do for a human that uh, gets lost in the wilderness and they, they find them. So um, that would be my, <clears throat> underlying rationale for uh, recommending that because uh, thank goodness they are found because uh, it's rough out there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so anyway, that's what that would, I would recommend that. Okay. Okay. Um, well, thank you for that. Cause uh, yeah, it's the, with the sunnier weather too, it's a lot of birds are going outside and hopefully they, you know, have precautions in place so that you know, they don't take off. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, we I, you know, in bringing, bringing that point up uh, as, as we uh, have people join and what and questions come in, uh, <clears throat> we have a little, um, I guess what you would call it, a, uh, uh, an, uh, an insect issue here in, in, in Louisiana um, and possibly along the Gulf Coast. And it may and, and may extend to other areas and, and people, um, uh, but we have uh, and it really started in about 2010, 2011, uh, uh, with these um, what they call them buffalo gnats um, or or black flies, and it's a, a particular time of year. I really didn't have a problem with it, and was was really knowledgeable and. And, and had birds out and knew a lot of people that had birds outside uh, before then. But um, these are uh, really aggressive um, feeders and they uh, have uh, really a, a very irritating bite uh, when, they're, when they're taking the uh, meal and they'll kill birds. They'll, and they're small black flies really in, in other parts of the country, depending on what you call them but uh, they have an affinity for birds and we have to always remind people here uh, that uh, from in April through, through um, 
I guess, uh, May to be watching for these, these black flies because they will bite you too. And so you know when they're around. But uh, it, it's something that uh, I know along the, the Gulf Coast, and it may extend up into the uh, Midwest, up into Missouri, maybe Southern Illinois, um, that they have these. But uh, always be, be uh, careful uh, and, and be aware that, you know, of insects outside, let's such as this, in a certain season, and also predators. So, Good point. Yeah. Good point. Um, okay, so we're gonna we're gonna dive into some of our um, viewer questions. And as a reminder, if you have a question for Dr. Tully to use the Q and A feature and not the chat feature, um, so we can capture the question. And um, okay, so Dr. Tully, um, let's see here. We had a question. Oops, one second. Okay, so Mary uh, Mary asks. Uh, my parrot developed a small wart-like mass on his back at the base of his wing, and the original biopsy was inconclusive. Um, they thought it was likely a wart, but after seven, uh, several months, it started to grow, and he picked at it. He's collared. No other treatment. It has started to grow along the wing length. So they're waiting results on the blood work, um, the culture and sensitivity, another biopsy. His x-rays are okay. He's an 11-year-old male Indian ringneck indoor bird. Weight, body condition, demeanor is very good. Um, she's had blood and x-rays um, when he was about five years and healthy for comparison. So they're hoping to rule out cancer, of uh, squamous cell carcinoma. Is there good evidence for the effectiveness of radiation? Um, she also wants to know if you have any articles you can recommend. Um, she has a bit of, she, uh, Mary has a health back, uh, animal health technologist. So she has additional university sciences. So she has some kind of, medical background to understand some of the more complex uh, medical articles, it sounds like. Well, that's good. I, I, you know, I always liked informed owners and I, I recommend getting as much information as possible. Um, it, is, it is fantastic to work with people like that uh, and pet owners. Um, and so uh, getting uh, back to the question, you, you had an original biopsy of this uh, little mass uh, at the base of the wing, and it came back inconclusive. Um, however, <clears throat> you know, and depending on how uh, we look at that, uh, usually when you're saying a biopsy, if you have a small mass, you got, remove all of it. Um, but I don't know how that, that the biopsy was taken. But nonetheless, it did come back uh, uh, inconclusive. And then, uh, so it has, uh, what you're saying, regrown and has become larger uh, a little bit, uh, kind of extending uh, down the wing. Now, <clears throat> the veterinary care you're, you're uh, actually receiving for the bird is, it seems uh, very good um, in the fact that you're saying that uh, you're waiting on the results of another biopsy and, and, and other diagnostic tests, but the biopsy, another biopsy is going to be um, uh, very helpful, I feel, uh, in, in trying to determine what it is. That's what you need to do uh, on this to try to identify what the cause is. What happens is that sometimes you have uh, tissue masses like this, or you have some type of a, uh, an area that you're trying to biopsy to identify what the underlying problem is. And um, the pathologists are going to look at the cells and the sections of that biopsy sample to try to determine what, the, um, what is going on with the tissue, um, you know, how the tissue is reacting. And it's, it could indicate that the bird has um, a cancer. Uh, but again, it just may be something that uh, is reacting to something, and and uh, but it's not cancer, um, and 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 then in the in the in the sense that it's just reacting to something, that it just means it's somewhat inconclusive, and uh, what they're finding on the uh, pathology on the slide is consistent with what you see. Now what happens is that, okay, well, we'll treat it for, in, in, uh, maybe it's uh, some kind of an inflammation or irritation. At that point, you hope that it just responds um, because that's all that was seen. 
But what happens with disease is that sometimes it takes time for the body to actually uh, develop um, changes that are that the pathologist can see. So this has occurred. Uh, everything was done excellent, excellent workup, and and it came back inconclusive was treated but now it's back often it just takes a little time <clears throat> with disease conditions and the body's response for the pathologist to see so um if it is in fact something like a squamous cell carcinoma uh, which is a kind of a skin tumor that it can be <clears throat> it can be identified at this point again it may not be We've taken sometimes biopsies of, of tissues that haven't healed uh, three or four before we finally get to a, a, a diagnosis um, uh, other than just uh, inflammation. And sometimes that's all it is. Um, and then we have to try to determine why it's inflammatory and it is not uh, a tumor. So. So you're going on the right track. If it is squamous cell carcinoma in most of the smaller birds, you can take, you know, excise excisional biopsy or taking that, that tumor out. Usually in cockatiels, we'll see these um, as, as you have described. And that is somewhat um, what we'll, we'll consider. Um, it will put the, the bird in, in, in some type of, um, uh, you know, uh, it, it's not curative, <clears throat> but um, it'll it'll it, it it'll take the um, the the tumor from that that area, and it's not usually going to regrow in that area. Um, but it may come back in another uh, part of the body. But uh, that's in these these younger, I mean these uh, the cockatiel smaller birds like that. Um, kind of a remission phase, but then uh, it may may come back. But uh, I don't know if you'll uh, really need um, a radiation and uh, therapy on that. And 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 really uh, for skin tumors, uh, the radiation uh, in in my <clears throat> uh, it's not very. Uh, it's not used very often, uh, except uh, radiation called strontium, and it's don't have very uh, far as far as depth, uh, as far as penetration of the radiation. So you have to remove that mass. Uh, so usually with these squamous cell carcinomas, you can just um, uh, just excise them and um, try to get all of the border, and that'll be fine. Yeah. Okay. And there's plenty of articles out there and you can look it up and nothing that I can think of right offhand, but uh, a number of uh, um, Dr. Spears book, recent uh, current therapy of avian medicine and surgery, uh, I think probably has a, 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 probably a nice description of that. Okay. Thank you. Um, so, and then Tabia asks, my Jende Conyers started having scary poops, uh, then threw, threw up on me on Tuesday. Um, so she, uh, or they immediately tried to make an appointment with the avian vet, but was told the next urgent care appointment isn't available for two and a half weeks from now. So is there any um, online options to get a faster avian vet care um, when the vet, when, if your vet's not available? Uh, <clears throat> no, I mean, uh, so, so she has a concern, let's just say it's any concern and she wants to get a, an appointment and that the only appointment um, is two and a half weeks later. Yeah. yeah, there's, you just have to find somebody, unfortunately. Um, and I'm trying to promote knowing uh, again that we need more um, the veterinarians. Uh, I'm not gonna say avian specialists. We just need veterinarians out there that have a basic knowledge that have an interest in treating birds. And I'm doing everything I can to promote um, uh, veterinarians uh, that are uh, you know, uh, students <laughs> to go in and, and the, uh, the wonderful world of avian uh, medicine. And, and we're gonna continue to do so. But uh, I know it's somewhat frustrating, but, uh, but if you have a, an issue, 
no different than if you, you know, I woke up in the morning and I had uh, diarrhea, I was, uh, you know, had gastrointestinal issues and I needed to see a physician, I wouldn't want to wait two and a half weeks to see a physician, you know? Uh, so um, I would just say, try to, to try to find somebody that, that would be able to see it. Do, do vets in general, do they, you know, do, do they set aside a certain percentage of their day for urgent cases that, that they get called or come in? Or, uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, you, and, and when I say, you know, and it, it would depend on uh, urgent, what, you know, how is a gastrointestinal, you know, it, it's, it's, it's a concern and I want it seen today. Uh, that would be somewhat of an emergency um, and, and how, how well or, or what have you that they could fit it into the schedule. Now, it may not be, and again, it may not be possible. They may be booked for two and a half weeks, you know, and I, I don't know. And that may be true. I can't, you know, they can't, they already have people they need to see and they can't say, well, we, we can't see you because we have this. Um, but usually most of the, you know, the clinics would have, you know, if you need to be seen that they could try to fit you in somewhere, it may take a little longer. Uh, you may have to drop the bird off or something, but they somehow most of the, the practices would be accommodating. And, and uh, sometimes if they can't be, they have to honor those people that have already has appointments and, and make sure that they do the job that they, they uh, um, the best job possible on those patients. And so um, if that's the case, that's, they're trying to, to make sure that that happens. And if they can't do it, then, then somebody needs to find out. But most, most of the time, I think that there is, it doesn't matter when Laura or that they have a special time set aside, but they try to fit it in, um, in, in that type of situation. Okay. Uh, and uh, Norman asks, what are the necessary things to do during molting phases? Is there anything you should do when your bird's molting, going through a molt? <clears throat> you know, I, I guess that's a good question. <laughs> we get good questions all the time and thank you very much. Uh, because you don't, you do not think about it much, but when, um, except when canaries are molting and they're not singing and that you have a red canary and you want to make sure that the feathers are red, that you're feeding the right food as it's molting. And, uh, and, and, and so the main point about the molting and if the birds are molting a, a number of feathers and there's regrowth occurring, that this is the feathers are developing at that time for the period, they're not gonna change until the bird molts again. So it is, it is imperative to always have good nutrition and you surely would wanna make sure that the bird has, has adequate nutrition during molting. So all of those feathers that develop are nice and have, uh, very good um, uh, architecture to those feathers, a good coloration and are strong as they develop because once they develop, that's it until the next feather comes out. So you want it to have as, as a strong and colorful a feather as possible and having the proper nutrition. That is important um, and, and uh, uh, otherwise, uh, there's there's uh, not much else um, that would you would do different uh, on that. Okay. Um, and Barbara asked my 13 year old female kaik uh, who has a tough time in the spring. She's itching frantically on her back between her wings and getting in her seed cup and throwing up food. She eats nutri berries, etc., fresh food like carrots and grapes and dried fruit. Um, and nuts and some seeds. So how do, how can she help her get her through this? Um, looks like springtime is a hard time for her kayak. Uh, Being itchy and um, throwing food out of the food cup. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. It seems um, a little upset. Uh, <laughs> and, and and so, you know, uh, as far as uh, this is concerned, it could, it could be uh, a number of um, uh, uh, issues uh, from uh, behavior or frustration, uh, just because she is apparently itching, and um, and and that's what you are seeing. Uh, so, <clears throat> uh, on on something like this, um, what in in most of the time, I would say birds that are in uh, within the house or they're indoors. They're not going to get. You're not going to have a lot of exposure to external parasites um, that um, lice, mites. Um, but um, you know, there could be some type of an underlying uh, issue on the skin. So uh, it, it, was, it would be good. Uh, and this is where blood. You know, when we're talking about a, a complete blood count, and we've talked about this before. This comes in where you see what's going on inside the bird's body. And, and if the bird is itching uh, and, and it seems obsessive to the point of throwing food out, then that may be an, it may be an inflammatory response, irritation. If you have irritation, you probably have inflammation. And so if that's where you can get uh, the blood work to see if that is in fact the case. If you don't, if the skin looks good and the blood uh, results are normal or negative, then you may be looking at something else there um, because everything looks good um, externally and um, there is um, nothing as far as the blood work is indicating that there's an inflammation going on. So that's where uh, with something like this, and, and it's obvious that it's a problem, that it just needs to have a good checkup and, and, and try, to, try to get to the bottom of it to determine if it is something medical or if it's behavior. Okay. And just because um, I know that myself included get like kind of a spring allergies. Can birds get a spring out like allergies that, that with the pollen and the like spring allergies is that something that the birds can be affected by you know um <clears throat> yeah thank you laura yeah i why not why not and 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 so there is um <clears throat> we did some you know work on the hypersensitivity and there are cases that are circumstantial you know where this african gray or this bird at this time of year, every year starts, you know, picking, uh, and and our feather destructive behavior, as we, as we call it, and I'm still in the transition, you know, uh, and, and so this is something that I, I don't see why birds should be immune to like seasonal hypersensitivities. That is very difficult to assess. It's very difficult to say exactly, well, the birds on this diet, it may be, it's not, let's just say gluten-free, not that we're even looking at that at birds, but you see where you have these sensitivities in other animals and humans, uh, birds, why wouldn't it, it, it occur also in birds? Uh, I don't think they're immune to it, but that's my opinion. And so you have seasonal allergies as it would relate to something within the environment, the air, pollen, what have you, then, then it's possible. But we just don't have any way of um, identifying it. You know, for me to say definitively, yes, this is what it is. Uh, but we do know birds have tissue reaction in the skin that's similar to hypersensitivity in other animals. Um, so uh, with that said, you know, that's why if we have issues like this that occur and we do see that there may be some evidence that there is a hypersensitivity or some coincidental aspect of it that you can try to change, uh, get a different diet, you know, change the diet. Maybe it's something within the diet, maybe, maybe, uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, uh, kind of look at uh, 
you know, reducing exposure to anything that you think that may be seasonal or what have you. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good, good. Uh, thought. <laughs> yeah. So, so this is an interesting um, scenario. Um, Rahima says that they have a, um, a one and a half year old cockatiel um, that has a favorite toy and the toy, it says one day screaming too much and seemed uneasy. He immediately fell in love with the toy and is quite, um, let's see. Now that his favorite toy, um, whenever he goes near, whenever they go near the cockatiel, he will bite. Um, he does this odd behavior with his toy. He stands on it and swings his tail uh, left and right while being on top of the toy. Is this normal behavior? Um, should I take the toy away? And if so, how quickly or slowly can it be done? And also, um, so he's having, a, they're having a hard time training him because of the toy. So this toy, you know, toy obsessed cockatiel, what, 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 what do you recommend for that? Okay, well, <clears throat> what you're, you're describing in the cockatiel is masturbation. And I think that this is something that all bird owners should be aware of because uh, it's, it's not uncommon um for the owners to um describe uh and, and call and question when the bird goes on their hand and starts rubbing its tail on your hand and uh this is this is uh this is just masturbation and uh you can notice this in your birds uh it may be a toy uh but it also may be a perch um that the the bird um will perform uh, this with. And so I, I, you know, if it's in the cage, what have you, I know my uh, derby and parrot would do it. Uh, it didn't uh, have any um, adverse effects, but it does appear that this, uh, the bird is, is somewhat uh, enamored with this little toy. And I would um, say that uh, uh, if you want to to feel like that it's reducing your ability to, to train the bird or interact with the bird, um, then, then I would say um, that, uh, that you can remove this toy and, and possibly get something that is somewhat dissimilar. Uh, birds will actually uh, look into the little mirrors that they have and fall in love with themselves, you know, with the little mirrors and regurgitate on the mirrors. And, and so this isn't something that's uh, unusual, but it is, uh, it does seem like the bird likes this, this toy a little bit better than you. And, um, and that's what I always say, um, if you get put two birds together, they'll like themselves. And in general, over, over time, same birds um, than with the, the human. Um, and it's, uh, you know, well, interaction. And if you are in, in, it, in, you know, you want to get close to the bird or, um, and, and have a very close relationship and, and interact with it, um, and train it, then, uh, having the bird, um, form the, um, inner part, you know, kind of the companionship bond with you is going to be better than say, um, uh, you know, trying to do it with two and two birds in in the situation, and I have have questions on that. So back to this this little toy. It seems okay. like it likes it better than the 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 owners, and so I would say that it shouldn't have any problem uh, if you remove it, but get something else in the the uh, the, the the cage environment that would stimulate, uh, say. Uh, just psychological behavior and <clears throat> foraging and, and different toys like that, that maybe aren't the same general shape as a, yeah. another little bird and, and removing it and then putting those in, there's no time frame on that. But that's a good question. And it, it is something that um, I'll go into the exam room and there'll be a bird masturbating on the, uh, the owner's hand. And it's, 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 a, it's something and, and they may not even know what, what it is, but um, that is not uncommon and, and being aware and, and knowledgeable of what it is. 
I think is is good. And, and really, we don't want to promote that um, between on the uh, between the bird and the owner, uh, simply because that uh, sometimes goes into more behavioral issues, um, such as um, the possibility of cloacal prolapse and cockatoos and and um, so uh, and feather destructive behavior. So good question. Excellent. All right. And then so Glenn, Glenda wants to know for a parakeet, um, how long if they lose their big flight feather, uh, if it molt, when they molt their big flight feathers, how long how long before that will fully grow back? <clears throat> usually, um, you know, we usually say about six to seven weeks, six to six to seven, um, give or take a few, but um, about a month and a half or so from the time if it loses it and the new feather coming in, um, it'll be about that long. Okay. Uh, yeah. And again, <clears throat> when you have the parrots um, molt, uh, they'll usually molt symmetrically uh, where they'll lose the feathers of the same feathers on the other wings. And they're not gonna lose them all and because they wanna fly in the wild. So yeah. they don't wanna yeah. lose them all at one time. I can't fly. Uh, something you know, some migratory birds this happens and they can't for a period of time but uh, the parrots if they're losing a couple like say the fourth and fifth flight feather they'll lose on the left they'll be losing that on the right too so watch for that well, reminds me of a fun fun project my, my kids and I did is we uh, we saved a like a, a year of our birds bolted feathers and then we glued them onto a poster board so that looked like it looked like a bird that like splattered on on a board by the time we were done. Because we had we waited for all the feathers to fall out, molt out, and then we put them back together the best we could. <laughs> so, I loved it. I love it. Yeah, and it was. It's a fun project if you ever want to do that. It, it, it's almost like an art piece by the time you're done with it. But. Oh, fantastic! Fantastic. Um, so Mari says um, hi and thank you for this informative webinar. So uh, they have a little lovebird named Yoshi who's three and a half months old and un, unclipped, um, probably remain unclipped unless you convince me otherwise. <laughs> so he's very good on recall and flies around the house freely. My question, the question is, he is neither banded nor microchipped. Um, we're torn as to whether we should have this done. Um, uh, they're both pros and cons. What are your thoughts on this? Uh, well, banding and microchipping and then the free flight. <laughs> Uh, well, I'm not going to uh, try to convince you to, uh, uh, you know, clip the, the wings, uh, you know, uh, feathers. Uh, if that's what you want, that that is perfectly fine. And I'm sure that the bird, uh, you know, gets around uh, very well. Just make sure he doesn't get away. That's it. And make sure the ceiling fans aren't going when he's flying. Uh, you know, just, uh, you know, and, and uh, he should do well. Now, I, the, uh, I really don't recommend uh, a leg band. Um, I have, uh, unfortunately, uh, you have to have leg bands uh, at certain periods of time. Uh, and it's, it's just, uh, if you have to, you have to, but I've just had to amputate too many legs or to treat too many situations where leg bands have caused the, the uh, foot to, to just fall off um, because it's just like any type of stricture. You have a ring on your finger and you fracture it, it's going to swell. That ring isn't going anywhere and the distal part of your finger is not, it's not a good uh, situation. And so uh, that's, that's why I just don't rec you know, recommend leg bands or keeping them on because if it can happen, it will happen. And so that leaves me to microchips, right? And so the positive about microchips is they have manufactured many microchips now, not the ones that are in the vaccine, but I'm joking. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> there's no nothing in the vaccine. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but they are mini microchips and they're about half the size of a regular microchip. 
and it it's uh, we uh, recommend those for the birds and um, and your little love bird. You know, your little love birds. Uh, you know, may weigh what 50, 60 grams or so. Um, it, it would be uh, reasonable to to put something like that in it. And then with the microchip you don't have to worry about that leg and i just tell you i just i can still see all of the feet and the legs that i've had to deal with with leg bands on that but uh anyway that's wow. uh, my thoughts on well, that you think someday we'll have a microchip where it has like a tracker on it so if your bird gets out you can track it wow that would be cool yeah you know i mean i i, I think that there's a lot uh that's, that's possible in the future in the near future <laughs> there we go you know driving right. those cars i know we should yeah we should be able to track if the bird that'd be that'd be pretty uh, much easier for re, uh for reconnaissance and getting them back home if you have track on it yeah. um so marquetta asks hello my umbrella cockatoo died suddenly a year ago aged four um practicing free flying he just landed on a branch and fell down dead um we did not have any autopsy um autopsy or necropsy but think he died of a heart attack now we have another you um, umbrella and would like to ask could a vet have found out if the bird suffered from a heart illness illness sure sure there's um there's uh evidence um uh, of that uh you know the pathology in the tissues um uh, if if they're and and they can't uh, for the most part, say uh, it was de uh, definitively a heart attack, but they can look at sections of the heart and look at the heart muscle, and they can they can say that the findings were consistent with some type of a cardiovascular event, uh, heart attack, or uh, something of that uh, nature. Um, and but. Uh, a four-year-old cockatiel, I mean, a cockatoo uh, that just uh, mm -hmm. falls off the perch, uh, you know, that's, that, that, that is a, uh, a very good example of when you need to do an autopsy or an necropsy. That's an excellent example because who knows what happened in, 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 in the speculation um is you know it's just um and 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 with no other signs it appears based on the question that the bird was looking perfectly good and just dropped and i would say that that would be rare as rare as if you had a four-year-old human walking and dropping of a heart attack I mean, it would be, uh, unless there is some other pre, uh, you know, existing condition or what have you. Now, I will tell you that cockatoos are one of the, the, the birds that have um, as many uh, have been reported in cockatoos as far as uh, heart defects, uh, uh, congenital defects meaning that they, uh, the heart doesn't develop properly and that they have heart murmurs. And it's not, it's not, and so when you're, you know, and so if you could classify that is that you weren't aware that your bird had um, an abnormal heart rhythm, uh, abnormal heart development and see uh, an autopsy would be able to determine that too. And so, uh it very well they could say definitively oh the aorta coming out of the heart had a very uh narrow uh it wasn't fully developed there was a there was a uh defect between the the left ventrum and the right ventrum and so they can see all of this and and tell you <clears throat> now that would be uh that would be more uh plausible as opposed to uh, why the bird died uh, of a heart attack at four. And then you say, well, why, uh, why would this, this uh, congenital defect or developmental defect uh, cause the bird to die, you know, at four, it lived this long. 
Well, what usually happens, and usually the cockatoos, and we had an eclectus, a uh, um, young eclectus with a uh, uh, abnormal heart development um, uh, that was less than a year old. What happens is the heart, uh, when, when you have these developmental defects, when you're, when you're smaller uh, in, in, in development, you're, you're, you're small, uh, the body can, <clears throat> and the, and the, they can uh, kind of accommodate to the defects. But as you grow larger, as, as the bird gets larger, as humans get larger with these, that's why you hear of some of these you know, children having so many surgeries with these defects, that uh, developmental defects, because as they grow, they have to uh, adjust uh, to, to, uh, uh, to make sure that the body can, can um, uh, adapt uh, in, to the, the, the change uh, or the, the, what they're missing in the, uh, the development. So with birds, we, we don't have that, that option. We can't say, oh, well, you're fine here. We better do uh, cardiovascular surgery to make the aorta bigger because it's, it, it closed the, uh, the defect between the left ventrum and the right ventrum of the uh, ventricle of the, of the heart. So, so this is what a possibility is. And cockatoos have a, um, uh, it's been reported in, in quite a few cockatoos. So this could have been the case and a necropsy would have been able to find it. So there you go. All right. A little bit on developmental cardiovascular, you know. You yeah. Know. Wow. Yeah. Um, so we had another question. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Um, if you could, Dr. Tully, um, explain uh, cosmetic necropsy, since many owners are traumatized at the thought of their bird being, you know, cut up or having breast feathers removed during um, necropsy, um, especially if they're still being, in, you know, in, during experiencing grief because of their loss. Yes, and uh, you, you and 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 I would say that um, as a uh, you know as a, a veterinarian, I uh, and as a as a an owner mm -hmm. of animals that I love, and have my daughters have had animals and and and. I know that <clears throat> that uh, how how difficult it is to make uh, a decision for an autopsy or a necropsy for animals. Um, uh, if an animal did a uh, post mortem exam on itself, that would be an autopsy for an animal. Uh, but since we are humans doing a uh, a postmortem exam on an animal, that's a necropsy. So that's kind of explains uh, the difference in terminology there. So uh, there are uh, a, a cosmetic necropsy <clears throat> is, is not a, a, a complete uh, necropsy. Um, because uh, the cosmetic necropsy is trying to uh, maintain the the, uh, the the patient, um, in, and it's very difficult to, to 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 maintain and get all of the tissues that are needed um, in a in a cosmetic necropsy. But it is a very uh, it it can be a very thorough necropsy. Okay. Um, that may mean that they're not going to be able to get uh, if brain tissue uh, and, and it may prevent getting some of the um, uh, different um, samples that they would they would normally take. And a cosmetic necropsy, uh, really, if you are asking for one of those and they are willing to provide that, uh, then you need to be and this is important, you need to be perfectly uh, sure between both parties what you are looking to have when you receive the body back. 
if you follow me on that. Mm -hmm. Okay. It has to be maybe drawn, written down. You don't want to say, that's not what I expected when I, you know, agreed for the cosmetic necropsy. So it needs to be done. It usually involves removing all, you know, organs or tissues that are suspect. And you can see it when you open it up to see if there's any abnormalities. Oh, there's a large tumor here or two, you don't know it's a tumor, but a large mass that may be a tumor. Oh, there was a, you know, you can see, oh, there's bleeding here. The, you know, the, the, the liver was, was fractured due to some type of injury. So you can see um, uh, possibly on a, a, a cosmetic necropsy what occurred, but then, then you can submit biopsy samples to get more uh, an idea. Well, Oh, the ventriculus, the proventriculus was very enlarged. And now we can submit adrenal glands. We can see, we can look and see if it was consistent with proventricular disease, dilatation disease. So this is all very helpful. And also like the little, uh, the cockatoo that felt if it was uh, an abnormal heart development, uh, you could see that and, and actually get um, uh, a, a definitive diagnosis there. So that's the, and then they can, <clears throat> you know, again, sew the little bird back up. And, and usually it's just involves the body because you don't want to do anything with the, the head. And then that, it, again, it's, it's limited, but it can be very, you know, pretty thorough and it's better than nothing, I would say for sure. Uh, but you want to make sure that you know exactly what and how it will be formed and how your, your bird would be returned to you. And then a, a, a full uh, <clears throat> necropsy would be uh, trying to get samples of, of all of the, the, uh, the tissues that they can. And uh, usually um, it, it, it's not going to be cosmetic, but uh, at the same time, it's done uh, with respect and it, it allows for the, uh, as much information as you can attain. Uh, in, in, and you never know where that, that uh, information to make a diagnosis or to try to determine what caused the disease will come from. But it gives the pathologist the best uh, options uh, to try to find that. With that said, you know, then you can have the, uh, the remains um, and, and you can uh, have that as uh, um, uh, into and may, you know, and, and have that um, into cremains and, and they have uh, possible to go ahead and um, have the, the little um, uh, bird and, and we can uh, make it uh, aware uh, the little bird is in uh, uh, this is given back to the owner after that as cremains. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and then Marilee has a little parakeet named Clancy um, that's six months old, but has lost the large tail feather twice now. And is not a feather picker and isn't molting and, and he eats good nutrition. Um, so when they brought him in, his wings were clipped and they now have grown out and he's starting to fly. This missing tail feather seems to hinder his flight. So any ideas what's happening with the tail feather? He's tame, gets daily exercise, plenty of toys to use him. He's healthy. Um, just this long tail feather just seems to be missing. Or... So, the, so the tail feathers are just falling out at this point? It's the large large tail feather. So it sounds mm -hmm. like one, the large, you know, like the long, probably the longest one on the tail. Mm -hmm. It's, it's been um, lost twice now. Uh, the old parakeet. Uh, yeah. Um, the, the, now how, how, how soon are, are these, the, the feathers, you know, losing when it, how how lost how soon are they are they coming out um let's see let's see if she can and can. what kind of bird again uh, laura a pair, a pair, male parakeet male parakeet okay 
because they have on the on the <clears throat> on the tail uh and again i know you know you have one that's going to be the longest but they have a few that look are very close on that and and they will they will multi mult these um maybe twice a year once to twice a year so mm -hmm. Um, I, I think if that's, in, and they will molt a, a number, you know, they'll molt all of the feathers on the tail and the, and the wing, uh, as you put your bird, uh, art together, uh, yeah. with the feathers. Uh, so I, I think that, I, I don't think that it's, um, too much of a, a problem if, I, if, if it's a, if it's a budgie. I'm, I'm, I'm going to go and assume that it's a budgie. I don't think it, there's, there's much to worry about at this point. Okay. I mean, they do say that it hinders their flight a little bit. Mm, um, um, one, one, even the long one tail feather, I wouldn't say that it would be. I, I, I just don't see how that would be a significant hindrance in flight of if, if it's a budgie. Now, if it's a, uh, it may be if it's a, maybe an Indian ring neck or something like that. Um, but I just don't see um, too much uh, issue there. Okay. Um, let's see. Um, I'm going to try. Okay, so we have a question from Tommy. Um, they asked, I've noticed that since the beginning of this year that one of the front toenails of my green cheek conure Moshi's um, right right toe extends at a crookedly angle, odd angle. So it's like up instead of curling down. You know what? My conure had the same thing. <laughs> it is not um, where the toenail kind of um, extends at a crooked angle and it's like up instead of curling down. The toenails like curls up. It doesn't seem to hamper her movement nor have we observed any apparent loss or deterioration of balance, grip, strength, or any um, ability to perch. So she has plenty of perches of different diameters and textures and is afforded you know, out of cage time to walk flat-footed on soft surfaces as well. Can any, anything be done to straighten the digit or uh, should it be trimmed back? And what might this be indicative? Like, could it be a sign of arthritis? No, I mean, from what I'm, I'm hearing, is that the, the the claw instead of going down is going up yep you know my conner had the same thing mm -hmm. yeah i mean it sounds very similar at least yeah um and so <clears throat> a, a, a couple of things uh this side of there being some type of a traumatic injury to it that that occurred where the toe really just kind of lux you know kind of turned then then i'm gonna try to do a screen share of the photo it, it, so while you're talking uh, uh, if it pops up it we'll uh -huh. see if this works um, yeah then then um uh then i would just say that it, that it would have been a uh oh oh yeah oh yeah yeah my conure had the same thing uh-huh uh -huh. <clears throat> well, what I would I would say is that right at the uh, where that that little green line is there. Yeah. That yes. what you probably had is at one time a uh, luxation um, of that where it, it became dislocated, basically. And so you have kind of a malposition of that last joint before the claw. And there's a joint right there. There's a joint. And so I just think what, uh, what happened was that there was um, a, um, some type of a trauma on that. And that looks like a green cheek or something. I don't know, a little bear key. But, but that's what happened. And, and so at this point, I just think that it's not bothering the bird and anything that you would do, um, you know, just to keep it trimmed if it needs to be, but otherwise it'll be perfectly fine. It'll be perfectly fine. 
um, and uh, and doing anything to try to reposition that joint or I, I just think is going to be um, just it's not not worth it. Okay. But it's it you know yeah. But I think it was due to a trauma at one time when it was young and it just kind of dislocated that, that joint right there. That's my thought. Okay. That's and you could get a little radiograph, you could get an x-ray. So that's, you know, and then, you know, get, um, get an x-ray of that to see exactly what's going on in there. And that may be, um, uh, kind of determine if you want to do anything but what happens especially if it if, if this this injury kind of occurred when it was young because mm -hmm. it looks pretty normal uh otherwise around there that uh the capsule uh around that joint and any of the ligaments are are fairly set and that to you know to kind of i guess relocate <laughs> Yeah. Uh, or reduce that luxation would be uh, difficult to kind of keep it where you want it to go. But an x-ray would uh, help kind of give you an idea of uh, exactly what's going on there. But I, I think that that's it. Ah, okay. Nice, nice, nice image. And yeah. Yeah. All right. And then I think this is our last um, let's see if we can look well, we have a question from Iona um has my has a cock has cockatiels um my cocktail has a problem with this the state wait okay I'm gonna say this my cocktail uh, has problems with the state to say covered nose additionally laps the let the t rod and makes a sound that is hard to describe but more or less ex ex exhalation with wheezing. The doctor assessed it as chlamydia um, after inhaling with a steroid after about 25 minutes, the bird behaved as if it had lost sight and hit the walls. The doctor does not know how to treat it. So have you had any encounter? Have you ever encountered anything like this? I hope I described that well. Um, <laughs> Laura, that was great. I mean, <laughs> Oh. I mean, I, I, like, I was, I was, you know, you did. Were you on know. the edge of your seat? Because I was. I, I, was <laughs> I mean, and, and, and really it's, um, I, oh, it's difficult. Uh, and I, I would say that as far as the, 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 the bird itself and, and, and I guess the best way to answer that is I haven't seen that. Okay. Okay. You know, I, I, I mean, I, I haven't seen that. Um, you know, we've had birds with, uh, and of course, over the years, uh, respiratory issues. And I really think the, uh, uh, you know, the, the late, you know, the young lady for her, her, her question, uh, I, it, it's just the, um, the information, um, there's just so much involved with that that I, I don't know from the 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 nares and the wheezing and then there's a inhalation of um, the steroids and then flying and I hope that the little bird is still still uh, alive um, mm -hmm. and that it recovered and did well um, but I just um, I haven't seen that where um, the nebulization um, with that and uh, the bird looking like that, but I can say that birds can have reactions just like uh, any anything else, and it may have reacted to the to the treatment uh, adversely. But um, but no, okay. not having that was could that, be that like was a, good. That could was that good. Be like a fight or flight response. You know the birds. Yeah, like yeah, that. could have been. Yeah, could have been very okay. much so. So another one. Um, actually, I'm going to announce, uh, we have a winner of our giveaway for today. Um, ah. so we know on our Friday webinars, we, we give away the bag of, uh, well, the, the, the fever tropical fruit pellets, as well as a second bag of the fever food that you of your choosing. Um, and that uh, goes out to, uh, Dorothy D. So Dorothy, you are going to get a, uh, email 
um, from the Fever Fund Office uh, next week to send that out to you. So congratulations, Dorothy. Um, yes, very yeah. much so. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I know. Good way to start the weekend, huh? <laughs> Food for your bird. Um, so, so, and I'm also, um, I, I think we're out of time for questions for today, but those are, again, some really excellent questions. And um, I apologize if I killed anybody's name or the, the reading of the questions. I, I, I try my best. So hopefully, hopefully I, uh, I got enough information out to you because those are really good answers you gave us. Um, and a lot of people are saying thank you for the insightfulness. I mean, we, where else are you going to be able to you know, ask a, a veterinarian a question about your your beloved pet bird um, and get an answer. I mean, it's a really nice thing that you do for, for bird people, Dr. Tully. So on behalf of our participants today, I'm going to give you a big thank you for all of you. Well, thank you. And then I, you know, thank all the participants. Um, and I really enjoy it. And, and, and really, Laura, uh, uh, I, I you know you're you're the best uh right reading and we 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 get that it's difficult i i know that um but uh that's all part of it uh, i try uh and we all uh, do that and and we couldn't do it without the uh, attendees uh bringing in the questions and we had we had some excellent questions uh, all of them were and and uh, it, it gives us all uh ways to learn and uh and, and provide the the best that we can for the our, our birds uh, that I own that you you know that you have and uh, and I appreciate and thank Lefebvre and Brenda uh, for their um, bringing this to us so so uh, yeah. uh, have a great weekend uh, yeah the, you too uh, we'll see you back hopefully in June um, and and then as a just as a sneak preview for next Friday we're going to have Mark Bittner as our guest uh, for our Friday webinar and uh, uh, Mark Bittner, if you uh, don't know that name, he was the focus of the documentary, um, The Wild Parrots of Telegraph Hill, that came out in 2003. It's a very good documentary, very popular with, you know, moviegoers and bird affectionados alike. So uh, you'll want to tune in, you'll see what, what Mark's up to today, as well as hopefully maybe we'll meet a special guest of one of the, the Conyers that he, uh, has, you know, the wild Conyer flock that he lovingly has cared for. Um, maybe we'll see a, an update on what they're up to. And then after that, we're going to have a webinar. So the weekend after next Friday, or the Friday after next Friday, we're going to be on with uh, Dr. Lamb, and uh, she's going to be um, going over uh, picky eaters. So big topic there. Yeah, <laughs> so, that's a good one. Yeah. So um, thank you, Dr. Tolley, and and again, we'll look forward to to having another um, ask the the vet with Dr. Tolley. So yeah, Excellent. thank you, Laura. Right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Yeah, have everybody a great have weekend. a great weekend. <laughs> All the best to you and your flock. Until next time, stay safe. Bye.